I don't know where this water came from. <laughs> I, I, I know I put a cup in here like a week ago, so there's nothing growing in it, so it's okay. okay. The Lord be with you. It is good to be with you here. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, we'll be reading verses 22 through 30 there this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 22. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who was Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for Him and find Him, though indeed He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own prophets have said, for we too are His offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now He commands all people everywhere to repent, because He has fixed a day on which He will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed, and of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't know, I don't know what possessed me to do it. Maybe it was a sudden urge for attention. Maybe it was a felt need to stand out. Or maybe it was Garth Brooks. I'm pretty sure it was Garth Brooks. But whatever it was that got a hold of me, it caused me to tell my third grade teacher, Miss MacArthur, oh, Miss MacArthur, did you know I can play the guitar? Now, I also, I also don't know what possessed her. Perhaps she genuinely believed that some kid in dollar store shoes had enough money to buy a guitar and to take guitar lessons in the third grade. Or maybe she had a great deal of faith in me and believed I could actually do it. I mean, really, when I look back on my childhood, it's always my teachers who seem to be saying, you can do it, you can do it, we believe in you, pointing me ever on towards the, the future. Or perhaps, perhaps she thought she'd call my bluff and prove me wrong because she said, well, Chris, just bring your guitar to class and play us a song. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now... Now, I should probably stop here and fill you in on a few details. Uh, first, I wouldn't necessarily say I owned a guitar uh, back then. What I really had was, was more of a toy. It was a toy. It was a toy. It came with a microphone and a, a little red and gold speaker. You'd plug the microphone and the little guitar toy into it, and then you could pretend to be a rock star so long as you were ages eight and up. It had six strings, though, just like a real guitar. Another thing you should probably know is I did actually at one time own a guitar. It was a tobacco sunburst acoustic guitar with a white pick guard and a sticker from, of, the, of the Ninja Turtle Donatello somewhere on it. Uh, but it fell victim to the influence of, of well, Garth Brooks, actually. 
uh, in one of those NBC specials he used to do, because I thought it would look really cool to take that guitar and smash it, like really up high and loud, you know. Like, and it was, it was really cool uh, for about 10 seconds. And the third thing you should probably know is I cannot now, nor have I ever been able to play the guitar. <laughs> but I brought that red and black plastic toy uh, to school, put it in the same closet with my backpack and, and my jacket. And when the time came, Ms. MacArthur said, Chris, you want to go get your guitar? Oh, yeah! Went over to the closet, got the guitar. I remember Ms. MacArthur's face sort of melting from an expression of, of excitement and anticipating joy to one of, uh-oh. <laughs> if the quality of my instrument hadn't given away, my attempt to play it most certainly did. I remember thinking, if I just simply took the pick and plucked the top four strings real slow, it sounded an awful lot like the beginning to Friends in Low Play. Boy, Garth was really influential to me when I was a kid. <laughs> So I, I plucked those first four strings, boom, 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 boom. I thought, oh, man, it all starts singing in now, right? Nope. So I did it again, boom, 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 boom. Nope. One more time, boom, boom, boom. Now, I, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I didn't know if the Holy Spirit was going to descend and a tongue of fire would come on me, and then all of a sudden I would in, in, in sort of inhabit the spirit of Jimi Hendrix. I didn't know. Would the world end? Would they come running from the principal's office? A meteor has landed in the schoolyard. We all have to cancel class and go home. Or was I just going to have to keep playing? Boom, 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 boom. On and on forever and ever, or at least until the bell rang at 3 o'clock so I could go home and hide in my closet until the fourth grade. Fortunately, I had a great teacher in Miss MacArthur. She was kind and gracious. She said, as I kind of went one more time, boom, boom, boom. Oh, Chris, I'm sorry. You know what? I forgot. We have to get on with the math lesson. You go home and practice the song and come back when you're ready. She was too kind. And I was too dumb. I never did practice the song. I felt like I had blown something, like my one chance to really impress somebody, a lot of somebodies, had gone by. Like I had mustered the courage to do something, even though I knew I couldn't do it, that would have been embarrassing even if I did know how to do it, and I still probably would have fallen on my face. I felt like I had messed up, like I had missed something. And you know, I wonder if maybe, just maybe, if Paul felt that way after his little sermon at the Areopagus, at Mars Hill. You see, in, in the passage in front of us this morning, we find the words to Paul's sermon at the Areopagus. Paul's been hanging out there waiting for some of his friends, and in the meantime, he started arguing with folks. Paul must have been a great guy to be around. He starts arguing with people about his faith, about the logic, the philosophy of it, when the Athenians catch wind and they haul Paul to the Areopagus because, because it seems to them that Paul has this new teaching. And as Luke tells us in the verse right before our text this morning, in verse 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. To them, Paul was the new daytime soap opera. He had the new narrative. He was the new album to drop, the new book to be released. What they heard him say sounded like something new. So they wanted to hear it. They wanted to hear all of it to see if this new thing was something they liked. Now, there's probably a sermon in there somewhere about only listening to the things we like, but that's maybe for another Sunday. They take Paul... They haul him up to the Areopagus, again, Mars Hill, maybe in your Bible. It was an outcropping of rocks, often used as a courtroom, a place for philosophical and political debate. And it's there where Paul delivers this sermon. Now, I have to tell you, it's a pretty good sermon. As somebody who preaches regularly, studies preaching from an academic perspective, it's pretty good. Paul gathers his thoughts around observations he's made around the city of Athens. Athenians, he says, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. He gets on their good side right away. 
For as I went through the city, look carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, Paul says. This is what I'm about to tell you. In, in the old way of preaching, Paul uh, is telling them what he's going to tell them before he tells them and then tells them what he told them, right? So Paul does this. He gives the reason for his speech, prepares them for what he's about to say. It's good rhetorical form. And then he moves on to state what may be his thesis. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. Perhaps from somewhere way back in the crowd, Paul hears a familiar voice go, Amen! Tell it, preacher! Tell it! And so Paul continues on citing a common ancestry for all humankind, thus a common creator, finding the commonality in their human existence. From one ancestor, he said, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. A lot of the times of their existence drew the boundaries of the places where they would live so they would search for God and grope for Him and find Him, though indeed He is not far from each of us. Paul in his sermon plays to a shared sense of longing for the divine. This is good stuff. This is a textbook sermon. The apostle continues using familiar, illustrative words from their, own, uh, from their own culture, a move many of us in modern homiletics would applaud, say this is absolutely right, wise and effective. Paul says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Words from the ancient philosopher Epimenides. And then he says, as even some of your own poets, particularly Aratus of the 3rd century B.C. says, for we too are his offspring. Paul Paul brings their culture into the sermon. It's good. And then he brings the whole thing around third and heads for home as he denounces idolatry, proclaims the need for repentance, and announces the coming judgment on an appointed day in the near future, a concept entirely different from what many of the ancient philosophers believed, for they saw time and existence itself as cyclical, you just pick a point in life and watch, and it will come back around. Maybe it's next, the next day, maybe it's the next week, maybe it's the next millennia, but it always comes back around. Paul, Paul points out, no, there's a day. And he nearly has the musicians coming down to the front, ready to play the first stanza of Just As I Am for all the Athenians to come flooding down the aisle when he rounds the rhetorical corner. And in verse 29, Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold, silver, or stone. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now He commands all people everywhere to repent. And because He has fixed a day on which we have, will have, He will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed, and of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. Now, if the other stuff didn't get an amen from somebody in the back, that would. It's that last line. That last line would have had some folks standing in the pews and shouting, Of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Those words uh, remind me of some words I heard this week from Otis Moss III, uh, words that uh, he writes in in his book, Blue Note Preaching in a Post-Soul World. He says, There is no shouting like the shouting in a black church about the resurrection of Jesus. As a matter of fact, he says, you can say the same thing every week. They hung him high, they stretched him wide, and then he died. But on Sunday morning, they said, and now everybody will go, amen, amen. To talk of Christ's resurrection, that ought to move some people. That ought to stir them up. But that ain't what happened. Did you notice? You got to read a little further than the assigned reading. It's like that professor who quizzes you on the footnotes, right? you got to read a little further. Luke says in the verses right after this text, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, well, we'll hear about this again. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris, 
and others with them. It's pretty sad, really. This isn't the type of evangelistic response one would hope for from such an event. This is Athens, the Areopagus, Mars Hill, the big show, a main stage in a big city where someone like Billy Graham would have sold the place out, had them waiting out in the parking lot, waiting to hear. Would have had them filling the aisles, hundreds of them, coming down. But Paul, all Paul could muster, Luke tells us, is a couple of women, which in, in that day would have been seen as a pitiful response. A few nameless other folks. There's no church left behind in Athens. No chapter of the Jesus movement meeting around the coffee table in the home of Dionysius. Nothing more than just a sort of kind nod in Paul's direction. Well, this was fun. I reckon we can listen to it some more. What happened? What happened? I mean, it's a good sermon. Was Paul off his mark that day? Were his references not relevant enough? Was his delivery too formal? Was it too casual? Did he forget to wear a tie? I bet that was it. Or maybe his skinny jeans clashed with his dark rimmed glasses. Was he not loud enough for the folks in the back? Did he preach too long? Was his sermon too short? Was the air too cold in the Areopagus? Or were people too distracted by the fans they were using to keep the heat of the sun in Athens off of them? Was he too political? Not political enough? Were his references too obscure or folksy for some in the audience? Maybe. I don't know. But I do know that for many of my friends and colleagues in preaching, we hear that a lot. But what was it? What was it really? Why didn't Paul's message cause every person in that place, every Athenian, to just give up everything? Why wasn't there a massive upheaval? Why wasn't there an Athens revival started right then by Paul? Now, some will say it's because the message Paul preached was too radically different from the kinds of things the Athenians were used to. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe the notion of time being less cyclical and more linear messed them up. Maybe the idea of a person dying and not staying dead was just too much for them to wrap their head around. Maybe. Maybe. Of course, others will say it's because Paul, Paul leaves two very important items out of his sermon. I remember the first time I heard this idea expressed. It's one, frankly, I like a lot. It was in the chapel at Truett Seminary. Dr. Gardner C. Taylor was the guest preacher. Gardner Taylor was and is a giant among preachers and is still immensely influential after his death. But Gardner Taylor pointed out that, that when Paul left Athens, he went to Corinth. And in his correspondence with the church at Corinth, Paul reveals his shortcomings at Athens. You see, in his sermon at the Areopagus, Paul does a great job of mentioning God, God creating the world, appointing a day of consummation, raising a man from the dead, but he never, never mentions Jesus by name. And he never mentions the cross. Which is why... As Dr. Taylor suggests, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, after just having left Athens, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what he said. It's a convincing argument, but I don't think it's the whole story. You see, I have another idea. One that is also grounded in Paul's response in Corinth after his perceived failure at Athens. You see, at the Areopagus, Paul engaged in a public display of rhetoric, a free debate with those who loved to sit around and discuss politics and philosophy. There was no shortcoming in Paul's approach. 
It's often cited, really, as an exemplary model of apologetics. There is no short-sightedness in his theology. He says everything right. He lays it out right. Maybe, maybe we can dock him a few points for what Dr. Taylor points out. But in fact, I would argue that Paul could have been right on cue with everything from pace, pitch, and projection of his voice to the use of metaphor and narrative language right down to the way he dressed and his posture in his proposed pulpit. Paul could have gotten everything right with his presentation before the people at the Areopagus and still had the same exact response. He could have framed his argument perfectly, presented the facts as he had them, connected the dots, and answered every possible question, which is what so many people expect every sermon to do. And still, Paul would have left Athens in no different shape. Now, why do I believe this? Well, maybe my thoughts are best summed up in the words attributed to Philip Yancey. Yancey says, no one ever converted to Christianity because they lost the argument. Let me me tell that to you again. No one ever converted to Christianity because they lost the argument. Yet how so many of us think that the chief charge of our faith is to argue. Paul gives a perfectly framed argument, but it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And I think Paul realized it. I think Paul knew it when he got to Corinth. Because you see, not only does Paul decide to know nothing among the Corinthians, but Jesus Christ and him crucified, Paul also realizes that what it takes to truly communicate the full orb truth of the gospel is more than rhetoric and debate. It isn't carefully crafted sermons. It isn't thoroughly rehearsed apologetic strategies. It isn't the memorization and regurgitation of Bible verses. It isn't well-timed sermons with three alliterative points, a joke, and a poem at the end. It's none of that. It's not political ideologies we place upon our favorite politicians to carry into legislative sessions on our behalf. It isn't bumper stickers or Jesus fish on our cars. It isn't faith-based production companies or family-friendly radio. It isn't anything that's called a worldview, doctrine, or dogma. And it sure isn't drawing an uncrossable line. While not all of these things are bad, in fact, some of them may be good, none of them can fully communicate the whole truth of the gospel. And Paul, I believe Paul came to know that. He knew it way back when, in the shadow of his shortcomings at Athens. Because yes, he says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But what he says further on into that reflective letter says more about the lesson he learned at Mars Hill. For after standing in the midst of those who loved lofty words and academic debates and political posturing and ideological demonstrations, Paul writes to his sisters and brothers at Corinth and says, likely with the Areopagus still on his mind, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, Paul says, I gain nothing. If I can speak with the greatest politicians in the world, stand before the deepest thinking philosophers and expound upon the great mysteries of the cosmos, but do not have love, I'm nothing. I think Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, sums it up nicely. If it's not about love, it's not about God. I think he got that from Paul. And I think Paul got it from Jesus. You see, Paul came to learn that all the fancy words in the world will never move the needle on the dial of one's soul without love. 
All the posturing about what makes one a true Christian doesn't mean a thing if one's not willing to cross over the lines we draw in order to love a neighbor, to love a stranger. Paul came to learn what I'm still learning, what we're all still learning, that the Christian faith is not a philosophy upon which to ponder, nor is it an ideology to defend and debate. Well, I'd even go so far as to say it's, no, it's, it's so much more than even a view in the way that we see the world. If this faith we have in Christ is anything, it is an embodied ethic of selflessness, of life-giving love. If faith in Christ is anything, it is life, breath, bread, and water. It's room at the table for everyone. It's dirty feet and unwashed hands. It's grace and forgiveness, peace in the midst of trouble, laughter in the midst of pain, hope when there's nothing left in which to hope. If this faith we have in Christ is anything, it's life. Well, a life that is lived and not simply discussed or talked about. It's a life lived in the reckless pursuit of love. For without love, as Paul came to understand, and I hope we will do too, without love, all the logic, all the philosophy, all the knowledge in the world doesn't mean jack. Without love, we're nothing. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and Sustainer. Lord, as we go about this life, as we seek to follow you in faith, help us, God, not to be distracted by doctrine. God, help us not to, to put all of our faith in religion, Help us, Lord, not to believe that our primary purpose is to argue and debate. But, Lord, remind us. Remind us as we seek to answer the call to follow you that we are following a Savior who exemplifies love and calls us, God, to a faith not printed on the page but lived out in flesh and blood. Holy Spirit, embolden us to live that faith out loud, to love recklessly as we pursue your calling on our lives. Holy Spirit, move now in this place. Speak to us. Stir us to move in whatever way you would have us to move, in whatever ways you are calling us now this morning. Lord, help us to be obedient to that call. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.